Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Texas Military Forces Museum. I'd like to welcome you to Camp Mabry and to our Close Assault 1968 Living History Program. This is an event we put on every Memorial Day each year to help us remember what that holiday is really all about. And we're going to do that today by putting a focus on a fairly recent chapter in American military history, and that is the war in Vietnam in the 1960s and the early 1970s. The Texas National Guard was not mobilized for the war in Vietnam. In fact, almost no National Guard forces were sent to Vietnam. During that war, the National Guard was the Army Reserve in case the Soviets crossed the border in Europe and inaugurated World War III. There were, however, a lot of Guardsmen who volunteered to serve in the regular Army during Vietnam and a great many Vietnam veterans who came home and joined the National Guard. So there is a nexus with our story here at the Texas Military Forces Museum. Today we're going to talk to you about the uniforms, the weapons, the equipment, and the tactics of the American soldier in the Vietnam War and his NVA and VC opponent. To do that, we're going to be firing blank rounds, we're going to be driving vehicles, we're going to be exploding pyrotechnics. And so before we really get going here, a word of caution. Okay? What we're going to do in front of you is dangerous. We are firing blank rounds, but at close range, a blank round can put out a plug of compressed air that's as good as a bullet, and it can and will kill you. I cannot blank adapt an exploding pyrotechnic charge, nor can I blank adapt a moving armored vehicle. Make the mistake of getting in the way of any of those things, and it's the real McCoy, and you are hurt or you are perhaps dead. So for the duration of this program, it is very important that you stay exactly where you are right now on these bleachers. If you have to leave the bleachers for any reason, Try and move as close to the crowd line as possible, coming and going, in order to be entirely safe. If you need something to drink uh, or something to eat, we have IOU barbecue right up the hill, and just past that in the building behind them, we have public restrooms. And of course, there are restrooms in the museum as well. And those are here and available to you and for your convenience. We are going to be making noise. Most of these weapons are not terribly loud, but some of them have a bang that's uh, noticeable. And so if you're sensitive to your hearing, you'll want to put your fingers in your ear, open your mouth slightly to equalize the pressure, and you will be just fine. So we're really glad that you're here today, uh, that you were willing to join us on a very hot and humid Sunday afternoon. Uh, we strive for authenticity in all things. The uniforms, the vehicles, the equipment, the weapons are all from the, the war in Vietnam. And uh, this heat and humidity, we're going to take credit for that. In order to have authenticity, we requisitioned this weather many months ago so that we could give you an ideal environment to talk about the war in Southeast Asia. The war in Vietnam, of course, did not begin with America's involvement. In the 1870s, France colonized what was then called Indochina. At the start of World War II, France was conquered by the Germans, and at that point their Japanese allies moved in to take control of what we would know later as Vietnam. At the end of World War II, the defeated Japanese left, the French came back in, tried to reestablish their colony. However, the indigenous Viet Minh guerrillas, who were backed by communist Soviet Union, and after 1949, the communists in China, rebelled against the French, and that started the first Indochina War. The French were defeated in 1954, and in the peace treaty that ended the conflict, Vietnam was divided in half at the 17th parallel with the northern part under communist control and the southern part, which the French had more or less managed to hold on to, under the control of a western-backed, pseudo-democratic government. The situation in Vietnam was perceived by the United States as analogous to the situation on the Korean Peninsula at the time of the Korean War. 
and it was believed that if South Vietnam was allowed to fall to the Communist North, this would begin a series of uh, wars that would ultimately lead to all of Southeast and perhaps Southwest Asia falling under Communist domain, which of course would endanger our allies in the Philippines, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as the United States position in the Pacific Basin. So when the North Vietnamese began a war against the South Vietnamese, the United States responded in the Eisenhower administration by beginning to send advisors and military aid to South Vietnam. In the Kennedy administration, that effort escalated. And then in 1964, attacks by Viet Cong guerrillas on American air base installations in South Vietnam and attacks on American naval assets off the coast of Vietnam led President Lyndon B. Johnson to insert conventional American ground forces into the war in Vietnam. So in 1964, this became an American war as much as it was a war between the Vietnamese people. We would fight it alongside allies, the Republic of South Korea, the Republic of the Philippines, New Zealand, Australia, Thailand would all send forces to fight alongside the United States and the South Vietnamese to try and stem communist aggression. When the war began, the American army looked like what you see out here. As a captain, I would be in command of a 180-man company, split into three rifle platoons and one weapons platoon of 44 men each. That would be three 10-man squads plus a four-man headquarters element. The riflemen would be, of course, armed with automatic uh, rifles, and then you would have a weapons platoon would have the M60 machine guns and the 106 millimeter recoilless rifles. That at least is what it was supposed to be like on paper. The reality in Vietnam was very, very different. In Vietnam, units in the field operated almost always at greatly reduced strength. So a platoon, instead of being 44 men, was usually somewhere around 20 men. Instead of having three 10-man squads, and maybe have what you see here, two six- or seven-man squads. This is what the American soldier, or as he called himself, the grunt, looked like in Vietnam. He is wearing a jungle fatigue uniform that is made out of cotton poplin fabric. In the later part of the war, we started to make those uniforms out of something called ripstop fabric. Soldier is wearing his LBE, that is his load buried equipment, so a belt to which he's attached his ammunition magazines, a butt pack that would carry rations, a first aid kit, canteens. He's going to wear his steel pots, the same kind of helmet we wore in World War II and Korea. Uh, this one simply has a camouflage helmet cover on it that's designed to blend in with the jungle. A lot of grunts would carry a towel around their neck. The country is very, very hot. You're sweaty all the time. That sweat is dripping off of you, and this towel is here to wipe that away and maybe clean your weapon in an emergency situation if necessary. The boots that we wear are special for the jungle. These are called jungle boots. They have nylon uppers that don't rot uh, in the humid environment. And they also have a steel plate in the heel and the sole to protect you from enemy booby traps called punji sticks, which we will be talking about uh, later on. The American soldier in Vietnam was the aggressor in most instances. He was going out in the field either on foot or by helicopter to seek out and find his enemy to engage him in battle and then bring in superior American firepower to destroy the enemy. The idea of the body count is to fight a war of attrition, to wear the enemy down, to make it impossible for him to continue to sustain the combat. And that is why the American soldier was constantly on the move and constantly the aggressor. We're going to talk to you now a little bit about the weapons the American soldier used and carried in Vietnam. Squads, left and right face, march. So when American, major American units went into Vietnam in 1964, the weapon most of your infantrymen are going to be carrying is the one that we have in front of you now. This is the M14 rifle. It was adopted by the Army in 1960 as a replacement for both the M1 Garand rifle, the semi-automatic weapon that most American soldiers and Marines carried in World War II and the Korean conflict, and the Browning automatic rifle, which was the standard automatic weapon of the American rifle squad in those two contests. If this weapon looks familiar to you, it looks like an M1 Garand, very similar in appearance. It weighs eight and a half pounds, so it weighs about the same as the M1 Grand. But instead of loading an eight-round in-block clip from the top of the weapon, 
the M14 loads a 20 round box magazine into the bottom of the weapon like the old BAR in World War II and Korea. Instead of firing a 30 6 cartridge like we shot in World War II in Korea, this fires a 7.62 millimeter round or a 308 caliber if you prefer. The idea of the M14 was to put a fully automatic weapon in the hands of every infantryman. So the concept here is that every infantryman essentially becomes a light machine gun. The cyclic rate of fire of an M14 is 750 rounds a minute. What that means is if we could ignore all the laws of physics and fire this weapon without having to reload, it could in theory put 750 rounds downrange every 60 seconds. Of course, on a real battlefield, you have to obey the laws of physics and if you fire this thing too fast, like any weapon, it's going to overheat, the barrel will warp, the weapon will cease to function, and that is a very bad thing in combat. In addition, you don't have a bottom of supply of ammunition. You have to stop and reload every once in a while. Another problem with this weapon is that as a full auto, it was almost uncontrollable. This weapon, even at 8.5 pounds, is not heavy enough to absorb the recoil of full automatic fire. So it was very difficult for a soldier to fire this weapon at full automatic and aim it to hit what he was shooting at. So more often than not, this was fired on the semi-automatic setting, which means that the idea of the M14 really isn't working out for you at all. A couple of other problems with the M14 in Vietnam, besides it's heavy, it's also long. It's a very long weapon, and that makes it difficult to move through the jungle and dense underbrush. It also has a wooden stock, and in the humid environment of the jungle, that wood would swell up, and that would give you all sorts of problems out in the field. So by 1967, the M14 was gone. It saw rather limited service in those first few years of the war in Vietnam, although the army in Europe kept it for many years afterwards. Interestingly, the National Guard was never issued the M14. It went straight from the World War II Air One Grand to the M16 weapon. We're going to let you see what the M14 looks like in operation. This would be a moment to put your fingers in your ear, open your mouth a little bit. Demonstrate your weapon. We have a misfire over there. These things like live rounds instead of blanks. But the neighbors have more guns than us, so if we shoot live rounds, they fire back and we try uh, to avoid that. So that's your M14 rifle. When it's gone in 1967, the weapon that replaces it is the one that we're bringing out right now and the one that I am carrying, and this is the M16 weapon. This is the M16 rifle. It begins its life as the AR-15. That stands for Armalite Model 15. Armalite is the designer and manufacturer of the weapon. That's what the AR means. It was supposed to be a full automatic weapon. It was ready to go, they thought, in 1963, but between development and adoption, the Department of Defense had messed with the round that this was supposed to fire and the powder charge that would propel that round, and so they threw off all the specs. They rushed this thing into service in Vietnam because it's much lighter, 7.7 pounds as opposed to 8.5. It's much shorter. It's got a plastic butt stock made by the Mattel company, the same people who gave you Barbie and G.I. Joe. You can imagine how the G.I. felt about having a weapon that was made by a toy manufacturer, at least in part. Uh, it, uh, they also told you that this was a wonder weapon. You didn't train the troops on how to use it, how to take care of it, because they said, you'll never have to clean it. It cleans itself. There's no weapon in the world about which you can say that. But that was the idea. They threw this into the jungle. All the teething problems had to be worked out. The weapon jammed repeatedly. It got a very bad reputation. And the grunts in Vietnam hated it. So the army had to back up, re-engineer this thing, go back to the original round, the original powder charge, and they came up with what you see here, the M16A1 rifle. This is a full automatic weapon that can also be fired in a semi-automatic uh, mode. It fires a 5.56 millimeter cartridge or a 223 caliber if you prefer from a 20 round box magazine. Late in the war we would have 30 round banana clip magazines to be used in this weapon. You can also affix a bayonet to the end of it uh, and that prong on the end that you see there that is your flash suppressor. This weapon became a very reliable weapon for the American soldier in Vietnam. Once those teething problems were worked out, you could count on it. It was lightweight. It's easy to carry in the jungle. 
but it does have a couple of drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is that that 5.56 millimeter round does not have a lot of knockdown power. 7.62 round, going to penetrate through dense jungle. It's not going to be deflected by vines or bushes or something like that. It hits its target. You kill the enemy. You wound him. You're knocking him down. He's out of the fight. This 5.56 is easily defected by underbrush or a vine, so you can't always count on hitting what you're aiming at. And if it's not a kill shot, you might just make the guy that you hit with this angry, and he's still going to be shooting back at you. Uh, so marksmanship becomes very important uh, to the soldier carrying the M16. Nonetheless, this was the standard weapon that the American soldier carries in Vietnam. It would also become the standard weapon that his South Vietnamese ally would carry. It would be the weapon that American troops would use throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s. We're going to let you see what this looks like in operation. You don't have to plug your ears. This thing hardly makes any noise at all. And in fact, we want you to listen carefully because if you listen carefully, you're going to hear a springing sound as we fire this. I'm going to fire on full automatic. My comrades to my left and right are going to fire on semi-automatic. Demonstrate your weapon. You can notice the difference between full automatic and semi-automatic. I dumped my 20 rounds in about three seconds. It took them about twice as long. In certain combat situations, that's a great thing. In a lot of combat situations, it's not a great thing because a scared soldier in combat is going to shoot as fast as he can. He's not necessarily going to take a lot of time to aim. If the enemy's real close, no problem. But it also means that you could get rid of all of your ammunition very, very quickly. One of the ironies of the M16 is because it was a lighter weight weapon with a lighter weight round, you reduce the load the soldier had to carry. The Army's response to that was to say, since you have a lighter weapon and lighter ammunition, you can carry more ammunition. So the amount of weight you're humping around never changes. It's just how that weight is distributed. The M16 was the backbone of American rifle firepower in the war in Vietnam but it was not the backbone of the firepower of the infantry squad. That's the weapon that we are going to bring out now. This is the famous M60 light machine gun. It was nicknamed by the GI the pig. It was called the pig because it weighs 24 pounds, and that's not counting carrying 100 rounds of belted 7.62 millimeter ammunition over your shoulder and often two or three rounds of that ammunition. So this is like carrying a great big slab of pig iron with you wherever you go. It is an adaptation basically of the MG42 machine gun used by the German army in World War II. It's a very reliable weapon, has a quick change barrel, so you can sustain at 650 rounds a minute of cyclic fire for an extended period of time without having to worry about overheating the weapon and having it malfunction on you. The man who carried this was one of the most important guys in the squad because this is the backbone of the squad's firepower. And everybody wanted to take care of this guy, but they also checked up on him. So when you weren't out on patrol, you weren't out in the bush, you would wander around every once in a while to the guy who carried the M60 and make sure he was cleaning it regularly, that he was taking care of it. Because if he wasn't taking care of it, the odds of it malfunctioning in the field went up. And if the odds of it go malfunctioning go up, the odds of your survival go down very, very dramatically. The M60 was ubiquitous in Vietnam. The infantry carried it. We put it on armored vehicles. We put it in helicopters. We put it on gunboats. It was just about everywhere that you could imagine a weapon showing up in the midst of a war. And we're going to let you see it in operation. This has an effective range of about 1,200 yards. Demonstrate your weapons. And so it's this flank over here that has the misfire this time. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're balanced here. Left and right, we don't care. We're going to screw up one side or the other. So, uh, so that is the M60 machine gun, one of the most important weapons the American soldier carries in Vietnam. The other weapon that was common to the infantry squad is the one that we're bringing out now, and this is the M79 grenade launcher. 
It is affectionately known as the thumper or the blooper because of the distinctive sound it makes when it fires. This is the weapon that replaces the 60 millimeter mortar in the American Infantry Company. It is a breech loading weapon, 40 millimeter. It can fire a high explosive, smoke, illumination, or flesh at round. It is a breech loader, so it's like a shotgun. You open that breech up, you take the round, you insert it in, you close it, you're essentially ready to fire. You'll notice that it has an elaborate sight on it to help the soldier who's carrying it hit his target. It didn't take long for a man who carried this to decide that that sight was utterly useful. You would learn exactly what the angle was that you needed to fire from in order to hit your target. This has an effective range of 750 rounds, and it was one of the best friends that the American soldier had out in the underbrush in the jungles of Vietnam. I'm going to fire this for you. I'm going to shoot at a tree right over there. Hopefully I'll hit it. No need to put in your earplugs because if you listen carefully, this doesn't even sound like somebody's firing a weapon. So downrange, that is a very effective piece of ordnance. It is a very deadly instrument in the hands of a skilled soldier. But notice, did it sound like I shot anything? It sounded like I pulled the cork on a very old bottle of champagne, does it? That's why it gets that nickname, the blooper or the thumper. And so here is another critical weapon for the American soldier in Vietnam. So now you know about most of the weapons that Grunt is going to carry with him into the bush. But of course, we're not the only people out in the bush. We've got an enemy. And that enemy is very brave, he's very dedicated, he's hard, he's tough, and he's dangerous. And more than that, he's usually a lot closer than you ever suspected he would be. This is an attack cell of the standard North Vietnamese Viet Cong Sapper Organization. The Sapper Organization was the primary fighting element of those forces. This cell would be part of a 20 to 30 man assault team. While our small arms were equal to those of the GIs, the GIs had a great advantage when it came to air support, artillery, and communications. That had a significant impact on the weapons deployed and the tactics of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. To overcome that advantage, the NVA and the VC deployed what was called a hugging technique, meaning we would fight as close to our enemy as possible, on top of them within 100 yards, stay close to the enemy. If we're fighting that close, Captain Hunt has to think twice before he calls in that air support or that artillery. If he's off by 20, 30 yards, that means his men could get hit by friendly fire. And it's anything but friendly to get hit by your own artillery. Uh, as the war began, the NVA and the VC were supplied with weapons that had been captured from the French or the Japanese during their occupation in World War II. One of the most common weapons was the one we're showing you now the Type 99 Arasaka rifle, a Japanese rifle. It has a five round internal magazine, fires a 7.7 .7 millimeter round, and can fire about 20 rounds per minute, an effective range of up to 800 to 900 yards. We'll now demonstrate that weapon. Neil. I should have reminded you, our weapons are louder than the GI's weapons. So. <laughs> very effective, very deadly weapon. But 20 rounds per minute, when you're using that hugging technique, it puts you at a disadvantage against the GI's. As the U.S. entered the war, 
the NVA and the BC became very well supplied by the Chinese, the Soviet Union, and other Warsaw Pact communist countries. One of the first weapons that they gave to the NVA and the BC was the one we'll show you now, the SKS-45. This is the SKS. It's a semi-automatic weapon, took over from the Japanese versions of the weapons the VC carry. <coughs> it loads from an internal 10-round magazine, fires a 7.62 round, accurate up to 440 yards. A good gunner could uh, shoot 40 to 60 rounds in a minute. So it also has the permanently attached bayonet on the end so we don't lose it. And this was standard issue, uh, made by the Soviet Union, uh, made about 5 million of them until they sold the patent to the Chinese who then turned around and put, made about 15 million of them. And they're still in production today. So we're going to see if we can get it to fire for you. That's the SKS. The SKS was a very effective weapon. Its range was about 450 to 460 yards. It, though, had some of the same issues as the U.S. weapons had in the heat and humidity of Vietnam. Therefore, by the end of the war, the VNVA and the VCA had been almost completely retrofitted with the weapon we're going to show you now, the AK-47. The AK-47 had some significant advantages over the SKS. It fired the same 7.5 millimeter round, which made that transition logistics much easier. On its semi-automatic mode, it fired about the same 40 rounds per minute as the SKS. However, it could be switched to full automatic. In full automatic, it could shoot up to 100 rounds per minute. It comes with a standard 30 round box magazine, but it could also be fitted with a 100 round drum magazine. With the 100 round drum magazine, they could fire up to yeah. 300 rounds per minute. Oh. Now its effective range was about 50 to 75 yards less than the SKS. But in performing that hugging technique and fighting close to the enemy, being able to put 100 to 300 rounds downfield in a minute was much more important than being able to shoot 500, 600 yards. The AK-47 is a very powerful weapon and we'll demonstrate it now. That is the AK-47. One of the things I forgot to mention is on our assault team. Our assault team would typically uh, use conventional or guerrilla warfare. One of the most important guerrilla warfare tactics we took was the attack and ambush attack. So the ambush attack was designed to primarily push the GIs into an area that had been mined and booby-trapped. It was designed to slow them down so that a larger force could prepare to engage them, or it was designed to lure them into an area that had been heavily fortified with booby traps, machine gun nests, and other uh, activities to make it a deadly killing field. Now, the attack team would be split into two teams. The first team would have three cells. The first cell was the attack cell. Their job was to engage with the GIs and create an opening in the perimeter. The next two cells that would then enter with gorilla, with satchels, gr grenades, and small arms to create death and chaos. The second team was exactly like the first team, only they had what was called a fire support cell. The fire support cell's role was to create cover fire, making it easier for the enemy to move around and get set up. That fire squad also would typically fire from two different directions, typically in an L. This did two things. It made it hard for the GI to set a perimeter because they didn't know which direction the battle was coming from, and it created a deadly crossfire. Now this attack followed a pattern of one slow, four quick. Slow reconnaissance to identify the strength of the enemy, followed by a quick approach, quick assault, quick penetration, and then quick withdrawal. With the NVA and the VC oftentimes plan that withdrawal with the same care that they planned the attack. The VC in particular were very good at removing their dead and wounded from the battlefield. If that GI followed them into that area, it could become a killing field for the GI. 
but oftentimes after the battle was over and the GI created a perimeter, they would not find any dead or wounded soldiers. This would create a, mini, a, a mind advantage for the Vietnamese. The soldier had to go look at his own dead and wounded when not knowing if he had killed or injured even any of the enemies. Now luring them into that minefield, we talked about the booby traps. The next weapon we're going to show you was built on the resources of the area. This is called a punji stick. The punji stick is bamboo or wood that was sharpened on one end and heated. These were then placed in holes in the ground or pits. The pit was designed for a soldier to fall into and impale themselves. But more often they were knee-deep trenches or holes with the goal of getting the soldier to step in it and impale his foot in there. Now the punji sticks were not designed necessarily to kill. They were designed to wound and slow down the GIs. Oftentimes those trenches were built with the punji sticks going down at an angle. The soldier who would step in there could not remove his leg without causing significant damage and injury to his leg. This would require that the entire unit come to a halt, set a perimeter while they carefully dug him out. Ideal time for an ambush or giving a larger force time to prepare for that attack. Now the punji sticks were also had one other feature. They would often take venom from animals, poison from plants or human feces and drop, rub that on the ends. Any soldier who hit them would then get an infection or an illness, taking that enemy off the battlefield. Those are some of the tactics and the weapons that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong use. The goal, not just to kill and maim, but create that many advantage. We wanted them to worry about every step they took, who was around every corner, and worry about that ambush, making their time in country as difficult and scary as possible. Rizut! The North Vietnamese Army, the Viet Cong, were very formidable opponents. When we went into the bush every night, we would dig in, form a perimeter. We would set out booby traps and the weapon that is being brought out now, Claymore Mines. The M18A1 Claymore Mine was one of the great defensive weapons of the American Army during the Vietnam War. They would be put out around units that are digging in, in the bush. They would also be placed around larger installations, fire bases, and forward operating bases uh, to defend them against sapper attack and especially nighttime sapper attack. This weapon weighs three and a half pounds. Inside of that plastic casing is one and a half pounds of plastic explosive. Embedded into that one and a half pounds of plastic explosive are 704 steel ball bearings. This weapon is deployed in a very simple fashion. The soldier will take it, he will spread two feet, little aluminum feet, out from the bottom so he can stick this in the ground. It has a concave shape so the curved piece uh, faces out toward the enemy. Soldier would then take an electrical cable. One end of that is attached to a firing uh, cap, a blasting cap. He would insert that into the mine. He would then unspool the cable back to his firing position which was usually 30, 40, 50 feet, uh, or rather yards in the rear. Then he would plug the other end of the cable into a detonator, which was called a clacker, a little handheld device. You squeeze it three times, the friction creates an electrical spark that goes through the cable, ignites the plastic cap, which explodes the plastic explosive, which then throws those 704 ball bearings out at a 60 degree arc up to a distance of 250 meters. This weapon is incredibly lethal. Anything caught in its blast is obliterated. It's designed so that it would hit a man at about his waist. It would cut him in two. If he was too close, it would literally shred his body into nothing. The Vietnamese enemy very much feared this weapon and for good reason. If they captured them, they liked to use them against us. Their favorite trick was to put them up in the trees, let us walk into an area, and then detonate the mines, and so all of those ball bearings are coming down on us, their version of artillery. They also like to come in at night, sneak up to our line of booby traps, pick those claymores up, turn them around, point them in our direction, and then feign a night assault. When we exploded the claymores, the blast would hurl in our direction. 
The grunts, of course, figured out what the enemy was doing very quickly, and so we would booby trap the claymores. If they tried to pick it up and move it, a grenade would go off, and that would end this particular threat. Claymore was one of those weapons that the GI would carry with him every place that he went. It was lethal, and it was effective, and we're going to let you see it in operation here beside of me. Demonstrate your weapon. So that is a very tame Claymore, okay? <laughs> if that was the real thing, 704 ball bearings have crossed that road in front of you and penetrated deep into the jungle. And these small trees right in front of us, they're not there anymore. And if the enemy was in front of us, he's not there anymore, which of course was exactly the point. So lugging around this three and a half pound gadget and a pound of cable and a pound of detonator through the jungle was absolutely worth it. So now you know something about most of the weaponry that the American soldier and his opponent is going to carry with him, but we had other things out there as well. The American Army had lots of artillery, it had lots of air power, it had a lot of armor as well. We sent good many tanks into Vietnam and a large number of armored personnel carriers, and that is what we're going to talk about next. What we're about to bring out for you is the M106 mortar carrier. It is a variant of the M113 armored personnel carrier, which is a standard armored personnel carrier of the American Army in the 1960s and the 1970s into the 1980s. One of the great assets that the American soldier has against his opponent is that if we get into a firefight, we can call on air, we can call on artillery to help us out, to bail us out. Sometimes, though, you want a weapon that's a little bit faster, a little bit closer, and this is where the 4.2-inch mortar comes in. That is a very good weapon system, but it's also very heavy. Its three components weigh almost 250 pounds, far too heavy for soldiers to carry through the jungle. So how do you have the effectiveness of 4.2 and still fight in the jungle? The American answer to that is you put in a vehicle that can drive just about any place you want to go. This 106 mortar carrier has a crew of six. That 4.2 inch millimeter mortar has 88 rounds inside of that steel box behind me. It can fire high explosive smoke illumination rounds to an effective range of a minimum of about 840 yards to a maximum of 7,500 yards. 4.2 inch millimeter mortar can sustain a rate of fire of about 8 rounds per minute. In an emergency, it can increase that for a brief period of time to 18 rounds a minute. A mortar is designed to fire its projectile at a high angle. You know, it arcs over the intervening terrain. So the purpose of the mortar is to drop rounds behind ridges and buildings and hills, to drop them into trenches and shell holes or foxholes or something like that. One of the really scary things about mortars is that if you don't hear them being fired and it's 7,500 yards away, you probably wouldn't, you don't hear them coming at you. Unlike artillery rounds, which make a great deal of noise as they go through the atmosphere, a mortar is a silent killer. You don't hear anything until about a half a second before it hits and explodes, then there's a slight flutter in the air, not nearly enough time for you to take cover. I'm going to let you see a 4.2 millimeter mortar in operation. I'm going to fire it from the back of the 106, but of course the round is going to detonate uh, over here to your right. Demonstrate your weapon. So that, that's a very close one, uh, but notice you didn't hear anything, right? Total silence and then boom. And if you were on the wrong end of that mortar, that's what you would hear in the last second of your life before it took you out of the fight. So that's the M106. Now we're going to talk about the pure M113 armored personnel carrier.
the M113, the standard armored personnel carrier of the American Army in Vietnam. We made about 80,000 of these vehicles during the Cold War. We sent 2,000 of them to Vietnam uh, where they gave very good service. This thing weighs about 25,000 pounds and has a top speed of 40 miles per hour. It is an excellent all-terrain vehicle. There are very few places it cannot go. It is also amphibious. It can swim. You drive this into a river and you can drive your way across that river at three and a half miles per hour. As an armored vehicle, well, there's not much armor. 1.73 inches of aluminum armor. So this is going to protect you against machine gun fire, small arm, shrapnel, but one of the things it's not going to do is protect you against any kind of anti-tank ground whatsoever. In Vietnam, the greatest threat to this vehicle was the RPG, the rocket propelled grenade, and the mine. In order to protect us from those weapons, we mounted machine guns on these things. 50 calibers and M60s. You see that we've got an M60 up here. Sometimes there would be as many as three M60s on an M113. Eventually, we took to building gun shields to protect the gunner when he's standing up out of the vehicle to fire his weapon. One thing about the M60 is we, we did everything with it. Uh, so it's in helicopters, it's on the boats, and it's on these APCs uh, as well. This vehicle has a two-man crew. Uh, it is diesel, and it has the capacity to carry a full infantry squad. It has a ramp in the back that can be lowered to let the infantry out so they can ride into battle protected. But that wasn't always a good idea, Vietnam. For one thing, when you're inside that, it's very, very hot. There is no climate control. There are no fans. There is no air conditioning. There are also no viewports. So you get disoriented very, very quickly. And if you're going over rough terrain, and you usually are, you got to get bounced around a lot in there. And that ramp comes down, and you have to disembark. You have no idea where you're at or where the enemy is. Another problem is that if you're riding inside that thing and it runs over a mine, which was one of the greatest threats to the M113 in Vietnam, the resulting explosion would kill or wound everybody inside the vehicle. We tried to protect against that by putting sandbags in the floor of the M113, and that then helped reduce casualties, but the extra weight proved too much for the transmission, and it killed the engine. So what most troops did in Vietnam is they rode on top. They rode on top. They could see where they were going. It was cooler that way, and although that exposed them to enemy small arms fire, you could get off of that thing very, very quickly if somebody started shooting at you and you would know where you were being shot at. And if it runs over a mine, you might get thrown off of it, but you're not going to get killed inside of it. So the M113 was another one of those valuable assets for the American Army in Vietnam. Saw a lot of service in every part of the country, and the American soldier was glad to have it with him. So we have one other asset that the grunt carries with them into the field and we're going to talk about that now, and that is the PRC-77 radio, or the Prick-77, as the grunt called it. This is the replacement for the PRC-25, which we carried in the first half of Vietnam. This is a great improvement in radio technology for the American Army. It is the full, first fully transistorized radio in the American arsenal. There are no tubes in this whatsoever. It weighs about 24 pounds, so it's as heavy as that M60 machine gun, and it's as important, perhaps more important, than an M60 machine gun. It has a range of five miles in good terrain. If you're in really dense jungle or rice paddies or swamps, that range could go down because of the humidity in the air. It is battery operated. The battery will last for about one day if it's not being used too much. So the RTO, the radio telephone operator who's carrying this, also lugs around lots of extra batteries. He's also going to carry lots of smoke grenades with him as well as his own personal weapon, equipment, and ammunition. This is our connection to the rear. So his job is to stay close to the officer because the officer uses this radio to talk to his superiors and to call in the supporting weapons that might be needed if we get into a firefight, we get into trouble. This is how we call 911 in the bush. 
So if I need artillery, if I need mortars, if I need air, if I need medical evacuation, this is how I get them. If we're in the field and we need to be resupplied, this is how we make contact to bring in the helicopters to resupply us. So the RTO stays very close to me. He is the most important guy in the squad because without him, we are on our own. We have no connection to the rest of the United States Army or our allies. And that is a very, very lonely feeling to have out in the bush. This also means that he is a primary target for the enemy. If he walks around with that antenna up in the air, that's the equivalent of raising a great big red flag that says, Hey, Mr. VC, kill me first. Because if they shoot him and they wreck that radio, then we're all on our own. So he's going to keep that antenna turned down until he absolutely has to put it turned up. He's going to do as much as he can to camouflage the radio that he's carrying so that he looks like just another grunt, just another rifle. In the same way that me, as a commander, tries to look like just another rifleman. There's no rank. You can't tell that I am not a standard GI in the field. My men know who I am. I don't need the enemy to know who I am. Because the first guy they're going to shoot is him, and then the second guy they want to shoot is me. And the third guy they want to get is the M60 gunner. Take out the three of us, they've got that American unit over a barrel, and it's going to have a very, very, very bad day. So these radios were critical pieces of equipment. They had to stay in operation because that is the linkage that allows us to call down the thunder of God on our opponents when that firefight begins to get out of hand. So now you know something about the weapons, the equipment, the tactics. Let's put them all together by demonstrating a standard tactical scenario for you. So what we're going to do now is stage a little fight. Not a big one, a little one, because almost all the fights in Vietnam were little fights between relatively small groups of men. We're going to fight from your left to your right. The enemy is over here. He's put out mines, booby traps, and he's laid in ambush. Coming from this side is an American patrol. Infantrymen on foot supported by a 113. They're looking for the enemy. We want to find him so that we can fix him in place, we can fight him, and we can finish him. As our men begin to come forward, the 113 is going to take a, a blow by a mine that's going to disable it. The enemy is going to spring his ambush. Our infantry is going to be forced to ground. There's going to be a firefight. At that point, we're going to bring up a reinforcing squad in another 113. They'll dismount, deploy for the fight, but it's going to be a stalemate. At that juncture, I'm going to come forward with that radio man, and we are going to call in the artillery strike that's going to break the back of the enemy. And once that artillery strike lands, we're going to go forward and assault to overrun the enemy position. What we're about to do for you is as real as we can possibly make it. But there are certain things in regards to reality that we cannot do. One of them is that the distances at which this will begin are going to be closer than they typically would be in combat. Uh, probably two to three times further apart than what we will uh, be able to do for you here today. So that's one thing. This fight will of course not be as loud as the real thing would be. Uh, but the most important difference is that we are firing blank rounds. There is no lead, there is no shrapnel, there are no fragments whirling through the air. And that is a very important difference because it means that we're going to be a lot more heroic doing this for you today than we would be in real life. But that said, the vehicles that are here, the weapons that are out here, the equipment that's out here, and the tactics that we are demonstrating are those actually used and employed during the Vietnam War. Although this is a simulation, it is important for you to remember that it is a very dangerous simulation. So as I said at the beginning, moving armored vehicles, can't blank adapt, exploding pyrotechnic, I can't blank adapt that. A blank round at close range, that's as good as shooting a bullet at you, the real McCoy. So remember that it's absolutely vital that you stay here in these bleachers, you do not come forward, you don't go off to your left and right while we are doing this demonstration, because behind me and to your left and right is now a highly dangerous zone, okay? This is going to be louder, so you want to think about your hands and your ears, opening your mouth a little bit. When we're done, I'll have a chance to come back and make a few closing remarks, but for now, you're about to get a chance to take some really cool pictures and some really cool video.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, what you just saw was the thinnest of thin slices of what the real thing would have been like. The real thing would have lasted longer. It would have been fought at greater distances at least to start. It would have been much louder. And it would have been infinitely bloodier. At the end of it, all of the participants wouldn't have gotten up to stand in line to take a bow. At the end of the real thing, a lot of the men who took part in it would never get up again. Many of them would never be whole in mind or body again. And even those who walked away without a scratch would never be the same because they would never be able to forget what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had smelled, and what they had done. Real war is not a comic book, and it's not a video game. You'll notice that when we fired our last shot, we didn't cue the soundtrack or roll the credits, because when the fighting stopped, it wasn't over. There were enemy dead to collect, captured weapons to gather, intelligence to look for, our own wounded and our own dead to take care of, reports to go to headquarters, medical evacuation choppers to be brought in so that the wounded could be whisked back to hospitals where an attempt could be made to save their lives and their limbs. At the end of a real fight, you don't get a menu that asks if you want to play over because there are no do-overs in real war. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. It is the one day that our country sets aside every year to remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice by laying down their lives for our country, its security, its prosperity, its ideas, in support of its friends and its allies. Veterans Day is the day that we honor all veterans, past, present, living, and dead. 
Monday is the day that we remember the fallen. Monday is not a holiday. Monday is a day of commemoration. It's a day of remembrance. It's a day of reverence. You should never say, have a happy Memorial Day. Because there is nothing happy that we are remembering on Memorial Day. What we are remembering is sacrifice. The sacrifice of young men and women who did not want to go to war. Who did not want to kill other people. Who did not want to endure the pain and the misery and the anguish of being away from home, let alone being in combat. But when their country called on them, they left their homes and their jobs and their schools. They left their friends and their families and their parents and their loved ones and their children. They raised their right hand, they took the oath, they put on the uniform, and they went far from home to do the mean, dirty, ugly, nasty job that had to be done. And Memorial Day is about the ones who didn't live to see the results of what they had fought for. In my career, I've had the opportunity to talk to thousands of veterans and soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen. And when we talk about them, we always use the word hero. And that is the right word to use. But every time I've talked to a veteran and they've heard that word hero, they have declined the honor and have reminded me that the real heroes are their buddies who never came home. The ones who still sleep beneath the white crosses and the stars of David in our national cemeteries here at home and overseas. That is what Monday is all about. That we spend a long weekend without the mail or the banks, attending mattress sales and ball games, and having picnics and family gatherings, is in some ways beside the point. But what matters is that we are able to spend a long holiday weekend, if you want to call it that, in exactly that fashion because we live in a free country. We live in a safe country. And we live in that country courtesy of the blood that has been shed to make it free and to keep it free. And so on Monday, amidst the family time and the sporting events and the taking a day off from work, all of us should take at least a moment to pause and stop and to reflect on what that day is really all about and to who we owe that privilege to. I would like to ask all of you to stand up. Gentlemen, if you would uncover. Company, present arms. Order art. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored that you chose to give us part of your weekend and to come and sit on these aluminum bleachers, the heat and the humidity, to help us remember what Memorial Day is really all about, to help us remember the sacrifice of the men and women that day honors, and to remember the service of all the men and women who have worn and who wear our uniforms. We could not put on this program to 
highlight Memorial Day and to honor our Vietnam War veterans in particular. And if we have any Vietnam veterans in the audience, would we raise your hands, please? Any Vietnam vets here? Folks, let's give them a round of applause. This program would not be possible without the hard work, sometimes the literal blood, sweat, and tears uh, of the veterans who make it possible. The men and women behind me, behind the scenes, off to my left and right, they're wearing their own uniforms, carrying their own weapons, some of them driving their own vehicles. They come from all over the state of Texas to train and drill. They learn how to act like the soldiers of the Vietnam War would have acted. How about giving these guys and gals a round of applause? And we're going to invite you to become part of what we do out here. We are always looking for volunteers to uh, join our museum family. And you don't have to put on a uniform and tote a weapon and run through the jungle uh, to uh, be a museum volunteer. We have all sorts of things uh, for you to do, and you can give us as few or as many hours a week or a month as you want. But we thrive on and must have volunteers because the museum only has a staff of three people. Uh, the museum also does not have a budget. We get no budget from the state of Texas. We get three salaries. We get maintenance and utilities because we're here on Kent Mabry. But all of our exhibits, all of our programs, events like this are possible through the money raised by the Texas Military Forces Historical Foundation. So if you become a member of that foundation, you put dollars in the donation box down at the end of these bleachers, or you put dollars in the donation box or spend money at the gift shop up at the museum, those dollars stay here in this museum to buy the fuel, the ammunition, the spare parts that these guys need to continue to put on programs like this in order to support our troops, educate our fellow citizens, and honor our veterans. Another thing that we'd like you to do for us is spread the word. Tell the people about what we do here. Tell the people uh, that you know at work, at church, at home, school about the museum. We're open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 4. We're free and open to the public, so you can't argue that we're too expensive to come visit and visit as often as you'd like. We also have at the bleachers, uh, at the end of these bleachers, a comment box. We like your feedback. If you like what you saw here today and you want to tell us that, that's great. We made an error. If you have a suggestion on how we could do this better, we absolutely want to hear that. Believe it or not, from time to time, someone in the larger community will lodge a complaint about a program like this. They'll say that we're doing something that we shouldn't do. We're glorifying violence. We're teaching kids things that they should not be exposed to. Whether you agree or disagree with those sentiments, that comment box is your chance to put your two cents in. But it's your support, moral and financial, that enable us to do what we do here at the Texas Military Forces Museum. So again, we're happy that you came out. In just a second, I'm going to invite you onto the field to talk to the troops, get a closer look at the equipment. But we do have some rules. We have some rules. Rule number one is please walk, do not run. We strongly suggest that you go down to the hardtop road, walk down that road, and enter the field on this lower road because this terrain behind me is very treacherous. It is very rocky. There are lots of tree stumps out here. There's lots of tangle and underfoot. Uh, it's really easy to trip and hurt yourself. Uh, so if you're going to come this way, you need to exercise extreme caution. Okay? We're going to let the kids pick up the expended shell casings, but remember not every round that they're going to find out here is actually an expended round. There are some duds laying around, and even though those are blanks, remember that even blanks can be dangerous. So if you pick something up, you need to show it to one of the troops and let them inspect it before you walk away from it. We don't mind you having a souvenir of your trip to 1968. We just want you to have a safe souvenir of your trip back to 1968. And if you find something that's not an expended round, a grenade, a magazine, a piece of equipment, that belongs to somebody. They paid a lot of money for it, so please turn that in so that we can reconnect it with its rightful owner. If you didn't get a chance to see the museum today, we're open until 4. We will be open on Memorial Day, 10 to 4 as usual. The outside exhibits are open from dusk to dawn, so you can spend as much time with those as you like. And we certainly hope that you get the opportunity to do that and that you come back and see us and come back and see us often. And for now, let's remember tomorrow that we can all take at least 60 seconds to pause and stop and to reflect on what that day is really all about. And remember, if you like your freedom, shake the hand of someone wearing a uniform and say thank you to a veteran. Thank you all for coming out.